Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to CES Day 2 and Day 2 of our Storyteller series. Although, for those of you who came on Monday to our CMO Insights Conference, this is Day 3. My name is Jean Foster. I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communications at CTA. We're the organization that puts on this little party in Vegas for 180,000 of our closest friends. Uh, each year, we strive to bring the world's leading brands and thought leaders to the storyteller stage. And today, we continue that tradition. We've got some of the biggest brands on the stage today with us. Later on this morning, you're going to hear from P&G's uh, Mark Pritchard. Uh, you're also going to hear from a phenomenal group of entrepreneurs in a session called BYOB, not bring your own bottle, but bring, be your own boss. But first of all, I'm very excited to welcome to the C-Space stage a phenomenal entrepreneur that I met for the first time about a year and a half ago. Anda Ganska is the CEO of Notch. And as a, a data-driven CMO, I was fascinated by the work that she and her team were doing on analytics, data, and trusts. Notch are working with some of the biggest brands in the business, and Anda is going to re lead a panel today with some great names who she'll introduce in a minute, but please welcome me in introducing and bring, welcoming to the stage Anda Ganska. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you all for getting up early. I know this is the first session of the day. My name is Anda. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Notch, um, but more than anything, I like to call myself a data nerd. And over the last two to three years, I've also become a pretty loud advocate for data transparency and trust. I couldn't be more humbled by the two industry icons who are going to join me on stage in a second. Um, but before I move on to introducing them, which I'm sure is more of a formality because everyone in the world knows Keith and Michelle, I wanted to give you a little bit of context on just the topic that we're going to be discussing today, as well as how and why I drew the lucky ticket to lead this panel. I've been either a math, computer science, or data nerd for most of my life. And like all nerds, at some point, I decided to go to Silicon Valley and never look back. That is until we decided to move the company from Silicon Valley to New York to be closer to marketers. But before that, while I was still living in Silicon Valley, um, I was surrounded by this really deep belief that technology is the end all be all, that it can solve most, if not all, problems in the world, and in particular, in the digital realm. So as that belief sort of rubbed off on me, I decided to follow my passion and build a technology that could enable us to collect holistic data about humans online. I wanted to solve for the problem of being represented fairly online as an individual consumer. And so what that meant to me was figuring out how to collect all the data that was relevant about a human, whether it was the clear data like emotion and interest, or it was implied data like behavior and demographics. And once this data would be shared with us by the consumer through our proprietary technology, we wanted to feed that data back to the brand in a real-time transparent way that would enable the brand to essentially action it and create a more direct, trusting relationship with the audience. Fast forward two years and we have built and tested a technology and we're, we're deciding to move the company from Silicon Valley to New York to get our first couple of customers. Little did I know that it wasn't enough. It was really just maybe half of the equation to have built the technology. The other half was changing the dynamics and the incentive structures of the industry in order to enable brands to have that direct connection with the audience and to enable them to have a direct connection to the data itself. This journey from being a naive techie to the moderator of this panel today changed not only our go-to-market as a company, but also my personal understanding of the words trust, accountability, transparency, and the relationship between them. Shortly after moving to New York, I realized that the technology piece was a smaller piece of the puzzle than I had imagined. The real battle was changing the behavior of the stakeholders in the industry to place the brand itself at the epicenter of the data collection, reporting, and ownership. Only in a world like this could brands have a direct trusted relationship with their customers and vice versa. 
But as you probably all know, that was hard because the status quo in the industry was to either allow distribution channels to collect their own data and measure their own performance, or like Keith likes to say, grade their own homework, which obviously would create massive transparency issues, or it was to have a data company collect the data once and then sell it as many times as they wanted to to whoever wanted to pay through an exchange. And whichever way you sliced it, the brands were in winning in collecting first-party data that was unique to them, aggregating it over time, and building towards them more direct relationship with the audience. Over the last couple of years, I watched as consumers became more and more cynical about the social platforms they were using, about the credibility of the news that they were reading, um, and even become a little bit more vigilant about the data that was collected about them and how it was being used. I watched them lose trust in the digital platforms because of the realities around transparency and accountability. On the other hand, I watched marketers lose trust in a lot of their partners because of data reporting mishaps, brand safety issues, and a lot of other transparency concerns. In short, I feel like I've witnessed a massive trust crisis that was created by human incentives and fueled by weaponized technology. And because we saw this coming, we decided to make Notch, our company, a Switzerland of data that worked exclusively with brands and collected the data on their behalf so that we can ensure that real-time transparent data flow back to the brand. We also decided to have a pretty radical change in our business model so that we only monetize from brands, which basically what that meant was that unlike every other data company, we restricted our revenue flow to selling the data once to one party. But we felt that that was important in this quest for becoming a true direct partner to the brand that was enabling that relationship to be built over time with the customer. So on that note, as we are continuing to witness trust diminishing across the board, there couldn't be a better time for a conversation with Michelle and Keith, who have not only made trust a core value of their companies, brands, and teams, but have also worked individually and together to push the envelope forward on this front. I'm thrilled to welcome these two powerhouse leaders who are blazing new trails for the modern marketer. So welcome to stage Michelle. Um, as senior VP and chief marketing officer, Michelle Paluzzo oversees all global marketing brand initiatives, strategy and execution for the IBM company. She leads a team of over 6,000 marketers on a mission to become the most outcomes-oriented, client-centric, agile-to-the-core marketing team on the planet. More than that, Michelle is committed to championing diversity and inclusion across the enterprise, leading IBM's women's initiative globally. Michelle brings deep consumer marketing experience to the tech giant. Prior to joining IBM in 2016, she led as CEO of online fashion company Gilt, was the chief marketing and internet officer of Citigroup, and was the CEO of online travel company Travelocity. Michelle serves on numerous boards, including Nike and nonprofit TechnoServe, and was recently included in Adweek's 50 Indispensable Media, Marketing, and Tech Players. Thank you so much for being here, Michelle. Pleasure. Thank you, Anda. And let's welcome to the stage Keith as well, who called himself the token male <laughs> participant of the panel. Keith is Unilever's Chief Marketing Communications Officer and has been in that role since 2010. Keith has, Keith has directed significant advances in digital and influencer marketing and technologies within Unilever and has championed the three Vs, viewability, verification, and value across the industry. He is committed to tackling stereotypes in advertising, gender, and beyond through Unilever's hashtag unstereotype initiative and is the architect be behind the Unstereotype Alliance co-created with the UN Women. Recent recognition includes Forbes Most Influential CMOs in 2017 and 2018, Global Marketer of the Year 2017 by the World Federation of Advertisers, the Drums Lifetime Achievement Award in 2018, Marketing Dives Executive of the Year 2018, and recognized as a champion of women in business within the Financial Times Heroes list. And I'm sure there's many more there. Thank you, Keith, for being here. Good to be here. So, um, as we are looking to kick off this conversation, I wanted to first ask you, how do you both think about this new world of data-driven marketing and what role does it really play in creating a more direct relationship with the audience? And also, how does trust and transparency really come into the way these technologies are being harnessed for, for the good? Michelle. I, I'm passionate about this topic. Um, you know, if you think back to where marketing was as a discipline and as a profession, even just 10 years ago, we've gone from it really being a discipline of art to one also of science and data. 
Um, technology was something sort of sitting a little bit on the periphery. Now it is core to our competitive advantage as marketers. And the ability for us to understand and interpret our consumers and, and hence help develop more compelling products, more compelling services, of course, more compelling marketing experiences is unprecedented. But with all of this, so, so that passion is deep. It means a fundamental rethinking of who we are as marketers, of the skills we bring to bear every day, and also of how we work as marketers. You know, the old kind of functional silo-driven approach to marketing does not work. And I think it, we, we at IBM are championing new models and agile and really changing the way we work. But your question raises a really important point. IBM is 107 years old. There's not a lot of 107-year-old tech companies. And I think the most important aspect when you think about IBM's 107 years, it's not the technology. There's been, I mean, now it's extraordinary what we're doing with AI and blockchain and quantum computing. But the more interesting thing is how do you usher these new technologies in with a sense of responsibility and a sense of trust? And I think it is the great question of the ages for all of us uh, in terms of data and privacy and whose rights data. And I'm so proud of the work you've done, Anda in this field to really set the course of what is transparent, what, what, starting the conversation about how we take all this data, all these pieces of information, which by the way, are proliferating at an unprecedented pace and will continue. Ginny talked yesterday uh, at the opening panel about uh, things we don't even collect yet, like actually fingernails, which can monitor whether you're gonna get Parkinson's. So this data will continue to explode. Our obligation is changing in fundamental ways on the issues of trust and transparency. Thank you. Keith? Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I think um, data-driven marketing done well, um, everybody wins. Everybody wins. And if you think about it as, as businesses, uh, we all win because uh, we find more efficient ways uh, to deliver our products and services to people. And as consumers, and we've all uh, been in the situation, if you can be given something more relevant, um, something uh, that you want, um, that is better. And if you are not being given uh, things that you don't want, uh, that's great as well. Um, so the only problem is exactly what you're saying, it's the unintended consequences. And I think that's, that's understandable, and, and we're right now in the, in the center of that. And I'm sure in a couple of decades' time, uh, all businesses will look back and say, well, that was a really you know, important uh, time in the industry. And I think all we need to do is really just work through this. And, and yes, of course, reap the benefits of, uh, of data-driven marketing, but also put the same energy in, in making sure that there's, there's accountability in place. Because at the end of the day, you, know, you talk about transparency. Um, it is all about trust. And uh, if you think about it, you know, a, a brand without trust is just a product. Advertising without trust is just noise. Um, unless we have trust, uh, we, we have nothing as far as business is concerned. And businesses were, were, you know, were born to serve people. And if you serve people better than the alternative, i.e. the competitor, your business wins. Um, and uh, it's as simple as that. And, and we spend a lot of time and money trying to make business more complicated, but that's what it's all about. And so I think the idea of um, greater transparency and accountability to drive trust uh, is good for consumers and, and good for business and good for society. Um, and hence, either at an industry level, you talked about the three Vs of, of viewability, verification, and value um, that at Unilever we've been championing for some time. Uh, that would be a, a good example about how as an industry um, we take advantage of uh, this, this new world. But I think as a, as a societal level, we need to be much more responsible uh, in how uh, we engage with, with, with children uh, and, and people uh, through the internet. And uh, I think that's going to be a big challenge for us. But if we collectively work on it, um, it's going to be great for everyone. Thank you for that. You know, one of the things that we were talking backstage was um, data ownership. And um, as a brand, what responsibility do you have when you're putting a piece of advertising in front of an audience from a data collection and ownership standpoint? One of the things that obviously we believe in, that I believe in, is that even though we are a data collector company, we never own any of the data that we collect. It's always owned by the brands that we work with. Because we believe that as brands are trying to become more direct to consumer brands, and I know this is a massive topic, in, especially in the world of CPG, they need this repository of first party data. How have you thought about creating this um, and really harnessing it in real time to become more efficient and you know, to drive more relevant messages to the right audiences? Keith? Well, I mean, yeah, I'll jump in first. Um, well, look, every day, two and a half billion people use a Unilever product. Um, I hope there's a few of them in the room as well. Um, and uh, good, good, good. Um, and um, uh, we can either treat them as a, you know, a big mass, but in reality, 
they are all individuals. Um, and it's an individual purchase, uh, you know, one by one uh, is what we're striving for. Uh, and if I go back to when I first started marketing um, a few decades ago, uh, we were using sort of secondhand data from retailers that was three months old to, to predict what was happening right now. And what we can do right now, of course, is in real time, uh, in a very agile way, uh, know what people are doing and uh, indeed know how people are reacting. Um, and uh, I can actually see on the front row here Stan, who, who runs um, uh, Consumer Marketing Insight for, uh, for Unilever. Um, he set off on a tremendous journey uh, a few years ago to say that we want going to get to um, a billion people on first party data. Now that might seem a bit weird because we don't have a huge direct to consumer business, um, but we realized that unless we built uh, the muscle of first party data, uh, we'd be left behind in this whole uh, conversation. Of course, uh, love second and third party data, and we invest a huge amount in that. But if we can combine that with our first party data as well, um, I think uh, it can create a very different uh, conversation with consumers, and again, serve them better. Um, I'm pleased to say we're um, already many hundreds of millions in, and I'm even pleased to say that Stan's going to beat his target to get to the billion, because I think you're going to do it next year. Is that, is that right? Oh, no, this year. This year, okay, fantastic. You all heard it here, he's gonna do it this year. <laughs> Quick follow-up question though. Um, how much of that data is coming from Dollar Shave Club versus the traditional product lines? Uh, and a very smaller part from a Dollar Shave Club. So Dollar Shave Club, yes, absolutely. It was a very important direct-to-consumer subscription uh, uh, move for us and we've learned a lot from that. But no, actually, to get to those hundreds of millions, this is in India and China and Africa and the US, etc. cetera. Uh, it's across the world and um, uh, and we believe that the direct consumer, yes, through communication, but also uh, through sales, is going to be a very important part of our business as well, way beyond uh, Dollar Shave Club. That's awesome. Michelle? Well, I think there's got to be principles that govern how you behave as a CMO, as a marketer, as a marketing organization. Um, you have to believe the data is being used to make the product service offering better for the customer. That has to be the... Uh, an underlying principle, the experience more relevant. Um, secondly, consumers have to have transparency, or clients have to have transparency about what data is being captured and used. Um, third, there has to be easy ways to opt in and opt out. Um, that has to be clear, right? So I think there's a lot, and, and I think GDPR and others are pushing us in really positive directions on this topic, actually. So I think the trade, people are always willing to make the trade, generally, uh, information for, for better experiences. Um, but, but you know, we as marketers, we as companies have to make sure that that's straightforward and transparent and easy for consumers. So I think the passion we have at IBM is um, how do we continually reshape uh, the experiences we provide to our clients, to our end users, to developers, to CIOs, to doctors, to nurses, to marketers, to analysts, uh, to make sure that they can do more to bring their own companies forward, to move society forward. Um, and the last thing I would say is AI is shifting this debate even further. Uh, because when you think about it, artificial intelligence, all of a sudden these other questions start to matter a lot more. Who's training the models? You know, who's, who's actually programming? Who's, who's at the heart of training these models? Because the outcomes, and back to the unintended consequences point, becomes different when you're thinking about artificial intelligence and self-learning uh, mechanisms. So I think it's pausing all of us. It's why IBM has, has released our trust and transparency principles, which we live by, and why we're so passionate about being a leader in the industry about how to take AI and usher it in in responsible ways. Actually, a follow-up question for you. How is it to be both the, um, the technology uh, producer and the buyer of the technology as the CMO? Because I'm assuming you're building a lot of this technology internally. How is that? I love it. I love it. <laughs> you know, I just think it's a, the most exciting time for marketers um, and, uh, and, and uh, perhaps for society, actually, when you think about the kinds of problems we can potentially solve, not without a lot of risk, not without a lot of questions, but certainly it's a time of, um, of potential, of real potential. So I think that artificial intelligence will transform marketing in three ways. First of all, it allows us to collect and understand much more about our consumers and our targets, our prospects, uh, our clients, um, whether we understand tone much better, whether we're inter uh, customers are interacting with chatbots, we understand their feelings, their tone, their intentions in a different way, their personality, insights. So one, that first party data can be so much richer and more interesting because of artificial intelligence. Secondly, it's changing the way we interact with consumers. You know, if you think about ads, 
and the format of an ad, it's changed a lot, right? Of course, over the past five, 10 years, but there's so much more. It's still very static. It's still very unidimensional. It's still very one-way communication. Um, with Watson ads, we do all sorts of things where you can go on and say, here's what I have in the refrigerator, and we'll tell you which soup you should buy and what a recipe for dinner that night. So completely interactive, ads that recreate themselves, rebuild themselves, reshift themselves based on your thoughts, your intentions, your desires. So it's going to change the format, the way we interact with customers. And finally, you know, marketers are sitting on, frankly, a deluge of data, a deluge of data. And artificial intelligence, like it will with every profession, has to help us change the way we work, has to augment our capabilities as a professional. So at IBM, we're real pioneers in AI and marketing. And we've just released recently into our internal 6,000 employees in marketing uh, what we call AI alerts. So we have very transparent capabilities. We're all in agile teams. We don't have traditional functional silos. Um, we work in agile squads. And our marketers get alerts, AI-driven alerts. Based on your campaign, based on the dollars you're running, here's some thoughts about what is your next best opportunity to optimize. And here's some other teams from all around the world that maybe be doing a better job at this part of the funnel that you should hear some of the stuff they're doing. So this notion that artificial intelligence can prompt a marketer, can prompt a doctor, can prompt a nurse, can prompt you know, a developer, a, a researcher, an analyst with new ways of doing their work, I think is really fascinating too. So those are the three things that we're obsessed about uh, in terms of marketing. Just as a quick follow-up comment, um, as, as a data nerd, I obviously am very excited about AI, but one of the limitations of any technology that is uh, dependent on the data inputs is that as long as the data inputs aren't good, then the data output or the insight is not gonna be good either. And so back to kind of the idea of first-party data, it, it brings it into this realm of brands need to have a really solid, transparent understanding of their audience. Um, That's so a really critical point. Quick follow-up question for Keith, actually, because I saw something funny on your Twitter uh, earlier this morning. You were actually tweeting about Stan's book. You were basically saying AI <laughs> at work, um, that you know they were targeting you with ads all over the place. Uh, I don't I know being, if it was just Twitter or everywhere. And I was you being said, hunted down, yeah. And you said, everyone, please buy this book so that it runs out so that I can stop getting this ad. Congrats, Stan, on having a book out. So what are your thoughts in terms of how uh, AI might actually move brands into the realm of being a little bit too creepy? Because that is definitely an area of trust erosion mm -hmm. with consumers. Yeah, just to, just to explain, I was, on, I was on Business Insider and I kept getting this ad hitting me over and over again for Stan's book. I should add that all the proceeds are going to the Ben and Jerry's Foundation. So if you buy the book, not only are you doing well for the Ben and Jerry's Foundation, you're going to empty that warehouse, which is going to hunt me uh, for the rest of my life. I don't know why they've targeted me, but uh, maybe it's your data-driven marketing, Stan, that's like, I don't know. Anyway, um, I think the good thing about AI will be is to help us deal with all the data. I think the tricky thing, by the way, marketing's always been based on data. Always been based on data. It's just that we have a lot more of it now and we have the processing power. And that's the, yeah. that's the difference. Um, and uh, the trouble is, is we have so much that uh, unless we can get AI to help us, uh, it's just gonna sit there in a big pile. Uh, and so I think the way to think of artificial in intelligence, and, and people say it's creepy, uh, and the, the word sounds a bit creepy, doesn't it? But if you talk about artificial light, can you imagine the world without artificial light? And artificial light means that we're sitting here in a room with no windows. Well, I'm uh, sure it was creepy when it first got started. Absolutely, right? absolutely. But used, used well, I mean, it changed, um, changed mankind, it changed society. Um, and I, I still think um, we are going to get to that, hopefully that stage where artificial intelligence has that same uh, all-powerful uh, approach if it's, it's uh, handled responsibly. And uh, I think that as far as we're concerned is, is the best part about marketing is the first thing you just you know, pass the test is, is, you know, would you like this to be done to you? Um, you know, would your mum or dad be proud? Um, and all those sort of questions. And if you just take the common sense test, um, I think it, it guides you well. Uh, and I, I think, um, of course, in these early days, um, brands and marketers will make mistakes. Um, but I think um, all brands should, should try um, and, and be an example for all other brands. And if we all take that attitude, um, I, I think, you know, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. <laughs> so on that front, um, another area that might actually road trust with consumers and customers is the idea of non-representation or consumers not feeling represented when they consume advertising. 
I, I know you're both very passionate about this topic and about diversity in general. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on how you've thought about creating frameworks or maybe teams or maybe initiatives to really bring diversity and to remove all stereotypes from advertising. We, I'm so proud of the work you've done, Keith, so you should start. And I have a few thoughts. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think um, the stereotype, I don't know whether um, many of you know about uh, the un Unstereotype Alliance, but uh, let me just give you a little bit of background. Back in 2016, uh, Unilever, we started just doing some work looking at the advertising industry general. So this is not just looking at Unilever work. Um, and we did a piece of research in, in, uh, in, in multiple countries around the world. And we found that um, only 40% of the time, uh, women said they identified themselves in the ads. And if you think about it, that is remarkable because ads are meant to engage with people. And if 40% of women are saying they don't identify themselves in ads, there's something going wrong in, in the ad world. And if you think about ads, actually, it is an ad world. It's not the real world. And it's sort of got slightly caught in the 50s. Um, and so uh, it went a little bit further. And we found that only 3% of the time uh, women were in obvious leadership positions in ads. 2% of the time were they obviously intelligent and 1% of the time had a sense of humor. And that doesn't reflect any women I know. So there was something bizarre going on. And so we looked a little bit closer at Unilever ads, and we found, surprise, surprise, that the more progressive ads uh, were, were more effective. In fact, 23% more effective. So this is no longer a moral issue, this is an economic issue. You can make better advertising if you uh, unstereotype them. And at the same time, I think what you can also do is, for the generations to come, um, you know, signal to the society about this is the sort of life we're all leading and this is the sort of uh, uh, life that um, is the real life, not the advertising life. Um, and then I, I approached uh, UN Women and um, asked them to actually lead this initiative because clearly uh, if it's going to be a, a, a Unilever initiative, we couldn't get um, the whole market there. And so you, the UN Women, and I, I co-chair it, um, uh, have led this initiative called the Unstereotype Alliance. And if you're a company and an advertiser, please get on the website, have a look, come and join us. We have already 35 of, of big global companies, so the, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Twitters, but similarly also you know, P&G and, and uh, J&J, &J, et cetera, uh, are part of this, and uh, AT&T, um, and uh, a handful of NGOs, and also the, um, uh, the trade bodies like um, uh, WFA, uh, the World Federation of Advertisers, the ANA, et cetera. Um, and I think collectively, um, we can make a huge difference. And we started to measure this, so we're doing, we've got market research, so we have a, um, a, a, sort of a, a bench uh, mark to start with, um, and we are seeing progress, and we're doing this around the world, and um, I hope in about sort of, you know, three or four years' time, we'll have real evidence, but we've already got some very good early evidence that it is making a difference, and indeed, advertising step-by-step step is being unstereotyped. It's been really amazing, especially the work you did with Dove, uh, just as a woman, feeling like I could see real women on screen was really transformational for me, so thank you for that. Michelle? Well, I think, uh, first of all, the work is so important, so thank you as well. I think that we're in such an interesting time and such an important time and on this topic. And I, I actually come at this with, uh, with, with a lot of optimism because here's the thing. I, if you are a male leader in this room, um, and I really speak to the men because it is still sort of 80% of C-suite positions and board positions and developer positions are, are held by men. Um, if you're a guy in this room and you actually care about this topic, if you don't, that's fine. Don't hire my daughter, it's fine. Um, but if you're a guy and you care about this topic, there has never been a better time to make progress. It's so, if, if this is a business priority for you, if it's not, no problem. But if it is actually a business priority for you, this will be your easiest thing to achieve this year. This will be the easiest business priority to get done. There is more pipeline than ever before. There are more models out there in terms of how to recruit and retain great people of color, gender diversity, et cetera. There's more best practices. Artificial intelligence actually can help us take bias out of things like pay decisions and recruiting and other things if we're careful and thoughtful about it. Um, so we know more. We can do more than we've ever done. So I actually think it's a really interesting time. I see male leaders, some of whom I've worked for, uh, some of whom I work with, um, or colleagues in the industry, really stepping up. And I think if you think about the past 10 years, there's been a lot of onus on women. You know, lean in, do this, you know, get a sponsor, get a mentor, dress a certain way, don't talk about your kids. I actually think the ladies should just kick back a little bit for this year. And I think there's a lot of men who are willing to step up and say, this is a time we can make a difference. And I think the good news is we are, we are certain that not only is it the right thing to do, but as Key says, you, you, drive better economic, you drive better economic return. 
So uh, IBM has always been a leader in, in inclusion. It's been a topic we've been passionate about. And it was the 1950s when we wrote Paul, our CEO wrote policy letter number four, saying we would always hire irrespective of race, gender, you know, identity, et cetera. So we've always been at the cutting edge in this topic. I think it matters more than ever. I think it's easier to make progress now than ever before. Thank you for that. It's inspiring for me to hear. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to take a few questions from the audience in a minute. So please think about what questions you'd like to ask. Meanwhile, um, I have to ask the blockchain question. So I know that you have done some work together. Obviously, I know IBM, one of it, your big bets is to, mm -hmm. to go into the realm of blockchain. And people have used the word blockchain almost as um, you know, a, a uh, synonym to the word trust and sometimes synonym to the word transparency. And so what I wanted to ask you is, what, you know, what's the work you've done so far? What are some of the results you're seeing? And maybe talk a little bit about potential risks of using a totally exclusively digital way to uh, track and store. So data. I think blockchain has this incredible power to, to make trusted, transparent, uh, transactions, blockchain can do for transactions what the internet did for information. And we see that happening now in food, food safety. Um, today, if there's a food recall, if there's spinach recall or lettuce recall, everybody gets wiped out. That does untold damage to farmers and uh, all over, plus, of course, the waste. So blockchain is already making big inroads in places like, like food transparency and trust and safety. And IBM has been at the forefront of a lot of those announcements, even yesterday with Walmart. Um, but if you think about messy, complicated supply chains, which is really what blockchain goes after, one of the most important ones in our industry is actually the media buying chain. Used to be that a dollar you spend, 85 cents hit the, the target, you know, was, was seen by the person. Now it's about 45 cents, 50 cents, 40 cents. So many different players, so many intermediaries along the way. Um, so one, there's a really interesting economic question about can we streamline Two, there's a huge reconciliation question about can we actually just process all this information better and faster. Three, there's really critical questions around trust and transparency. Where are my ads really showing up? Um, and do I really understand that? And so uh, Unilever has been a real leader in this field to step up and say, it, it's early days, it's very early days. But can we together, and Monday we announced a much larger coalition working very closely with Media Ocean. Can we together take this complicated, messy supply chain, which is media buying, use new forms of technology, particularly blockchain, to actually increase uh, economic efficiency and transparency? And that's, I think, the heart of the question. And, and we're deep into pilot and starting to see some interesting results. Yeah, I suppose it, it wouldn't be CES if we didn't mention blockchain. So um, I suppose we ha have to mention blockchain um, because uh, I think um, it could be. Um, a fantastic answer to some of the challenges we have. Uh, and you're right, it's er early days, but if you think about it, it has to be the right answer. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen that wonderful thing called the Lunascape, where it's this massive maze of all the various people who are involved um, to uh, actually get an ad in front of a consumer, uh, with everyone on the way taking a little bit of a, a cut, as you say. Um, the first thing I should say is actually is, is another uh, a member of the Unilever team who runs our global media, Luis is, is in the room and he'd shoot me if I didn't say it. To us this is not an issue about us working with our media agencies. So we have a very transparent relationship uh, with, with Mindshare, uh, part of WPP and that works really, really well. The difficulty is, is back to the Lunascape where you have literally thousands of people um, and if it's already complicated enough in traditional supply chains like food or whatever, uh, the media market is even a, a bigger maze, um, uh, or dare I even say a swamp, uh, and it really is. And to find your way through that, and we're one of the largest advertisers in the world, uh, is, really, is really challenging at times. Now, we have the resources, the expertise, the specialists, working with great companies uh, like IBM, the opportunity to, to sort that out. But imagine all the other people out there buying advertising who don't have our resources, and they're the people um, who are uh, you know, unwittingly uh, not only not being very efficient, but also there's fraud out there. It's about $10 billion worth of fraud. So I think blockchain could be a great answer um, uh, in, in um, piecing together uh, the, the maze that is the, uh, is the media world uh, and doing it in a very much, uh, a much more transparent way. Now, the trouble is, is that of course it is such um, a difficult and challenging market. Uh, we're not going to be able to solve this overnight. So I want, I just want to you know, manage expectations. Um, but the early days are actually quite, quite promising. So, uh, and if I go across to a supply chain like tea, we're the largest tea company in the world, uh, we, we're doing a, a pilot in uh, Malawi right now uh, um, on tea coming into the UK market. Um, and again, early days, but that's encouraging. 
So if you can sort it out for tea, you know, the people who will win there will be the, the smallholder farmers. It would be a huge positive effect on societies around the world. And if you can sort it out for media, I think then it would be extraordinary because there's a lot of waste out there. So I'm really excited what we're doing. And um, hey, we're going to make a success of it, aren't we? Yes. Good. Wonderful. So I've got a yes Thank from you. you. I've got a yes from Stan. Perfect. <laughs> So I think we need to turn it over to the audience. Um, does anyone have any questions? Let's see, we have one person over there. Hey, so I know you guys um, touched briefly on GDPR, um, but I was wondering if you could talk about, uh, from a marketer's perspective, some of the other sort of legal and regulatory stuff around trust and transparency. So. Um, something like the CCPA going into effect next year. Because uh, I know the ANA recently called for uh, sort of a more comprehensive US privacy law and just getting your thoughts on that. So look, the first thing is, is uh, I think we need to have a, a whole system approach to, to data. Um, and so I'm, I'm all, by the way, I'm a great fan of GDPR. Um, I am all for um, advertisers, agencies, media owners, publishers, the governments um, to come together. Because if we don't, the, all the benefits we were talking about data-driven marketing will go out through, through, through the window uh, if, if uh, consumers, if people, uh, lose trust. Um, and so uh, I, I do believe uh, trust is, is critical for this all to work. Um, and hence, having you know, really solid approaches to, to data, uh, I think, to be encouraged. So I think what we do need to do, though, is, is work as an industry. So I don't think anyone has all the solutions here. But collectively, we, we certainly do. And um, I've certainly found in, in Europe, um, uh, GDPR has been a really positive uh, step. Uh, we take the same high uh, levels of, of data around the world. So it, to us, it doesn't matter what country you're in. There is a, a Unilever standard uh, that we adhere to. Um, and I think you know, as we go forward, industry proactively working with governments uh, is the way forward. That's well said. For, for what it's worth, uh, a real quick two cents from my side. I think GDPR was really just the beginning. It's a lot more of a binary switch. What do you want to share or not? Um, I think potentially the future will involve uh, consumers actually asking for more control over being able to edit what data is actually shared with the brand. And so the technology to actually do that is uh, quite challenging to build. So we're excited to uh, take a stab at stuff like that as well. Who else? I think we've done a pretty good job of answering. Oh, no, there's someone there. Over there. Oh, I can't see. Hi, thank you. Um, the question is about, or on the diversity topic, one of the biggest challenges, you talked about pipeline and opportunity and uh, recruiting. And one thing I don't hear a lot about is how to start at the beginning when it comes to education, whether that's STEM or defining role models. Um, you know, the books that the, the, the kids read and how they define who they want to be. So I'm curious about what your brands are doing in STEM or in that role model definition and what opportunity and responsibility you think that the biggest brands in the world have to sort of help create that future. I think our responsibility is huge. And I think, um, in fact, Jenny yesterday announced uh, another step for us, which is sort of coalition on, on internships, which we're really excited about. But, you know, I, I can give a ton of examples. We've always been a huge investor in STEM and work with lots of organizations. But one thing I'm really proud of um, is IBM has been sort of a pioneer in a program called Partnerships in Technology. It's these P-Tech schools. And we'll now have, we have over 100,000 kids graduating. So this is a scaled program. It's a six year school. It's four years of high school and two years of sort of uh, associate degree. And you are doing internships the entire six years. So I get the huge privilege of working with lots of P-TECH students every day at IBM. Um, and we, along with a lot of other companies that we have recruited, hire these young people really from tough neighborhoods. Well, these schools are in, in pretty tough areas. Um, and a lot of these children don't have a lot of paths. But this schooling on paths technology is intensive training in STEM. But it's also real world application because you're working the entire time. And so you walk into an IBM office and, and you will find a bunch of P-TECH students there as interns for the six years they're in the program. So it is a deep, deep, deep commitment. And it's not just here in the United States. It's now happening where rolling it out to countries all around the world. I think we're, we're gonna double the number of, of young people involved here just in the next year or two. So 
Uh, it's got an incredible track record of success. The graduation rates, the success rates, many of them go on to four-year schools or to additional training. Um, almost all of them get job offers from the companies they've been working with throughout. Um, it's real-world application. It's real-world technology. We like to call this sometimes new-collar jobs. It's not blue-collar jobs, not white-collar jobs, right? It's really sort of new-collar jobs, really new ways of maybe not having a PhD in coding, but having enough training that you're going in and actually making a difference in STEM fields. So I think programs like this that are scale programs, not just, oh, we did this great little you know, thing here on the weekend and it was really powerful, but these, these real scale programs are about our accountability as a company to make sure that everybody is prepared for the next generation of technology, that this isn't an era that benefits the few, it benefits the many. And I know Unilever and many other brands are passionate and, and doing an awful lot as well, but I think um, you can't be a company, you certainly can't be a company, a tech company that's been around for 107 years without having to think about these questions of society and how do we usher in these new technologies responsibly. So we're very convictious about young people at every stage. We have lots of programs about re-entry uh, into the workforce, especially for moms who have been out of the workforce for a while. Um, we're really passionate about STEM and we're, we're very committed to scale programs like P-TECH, which are public-private partnerships that enable you know, hundreds of thousands of kids and hopefully soon millions to be part of the next generation of technology so that when we come here, this room looks like the world. Oh, I'd, hey, I'd very much agree with you. And I think it's a great question because there is certainly, you'd expect companies like IBM and Unilever um, to, to do um, uh, progressive work in this area. And, and I think uh, indeed both organizations do. I think also we need to go a step further um, and, and also think about our brands. Um, uh, all of us here about what role our brands play in society as well. And we talked about unstereotype. Um, but I'd also say that um, one of the, the great beliefs that Unilever has is, uh, is the whole area of brands with purpose. And we believe that brands should be more than just their product benefits or even just the emotional benefits. It should have a, a role in society um, and a positive contribution. So um, I suppose one of the, the perfect examples to try and bring alive uh, your question uh, would be Dove. And, and what we say is, is we, want, we want to have brands say and brand do. So the brand say is, is the Dove advertising, which hopefully you've seen, uh, which talks about you know, which beauty. Which is amazing. A, which talks about beauty in a, a very different way. Um, uh, but what it really tries to tackle is this whole area of self-esteem. What you might not know is the, is the brand uh, do side of, of Dove, is Dove is the largest um, educator of uh, self-esteem in the world. Uh, and we work um, with, with many bodies, but principally um, with the Girl Guides. And we actually do um, these amazing uh, programs with young girls. And I've been on a few of them, and, and it tries to decode the beauty industry. So it starts off like, puts a magazine cover up, and it says, like, everyone in the room, you know, get in the position of the model. And so everyone tries to get in the position, and you can't do it. They say, yeah, yeah, no, actually, they, they actually cut her arm, and they've removed it over there to better frame the picture. And they explain, um, you know, all the things about retouching, et cetera, and they basically pull apart the beauty industry and explain to young girls that, you know, don't, don't you know, believe everything you see, because uh, there's something going on here. And when you see the work that Dove does, and we've now got to 30 million, um, so we've still got a few to go, but 30 million is at scale. Uh, we've now got to 30 million um, uh, of these uh, interactions. Um, and I think that's what we need to do as, I think, collectives brands, is not just support a cause, say something. I think what brands need to do is do something as well. So yes, do it in your advertising, but then get a program behind that actually then makes a, uh, an impact on a one-to-one on -one basis. I love that idea. So we have a couple of more minutes and I want to ask you one final question because it is the beginning of the year and I feel like this question has to be asked. What are the things that you're most excited about and the things that you think are going to be most challenging in 2019? Okay, I think the most exciting thing, this is the year I really believe that uh, data-driven marketing is actually going to deliver at scale. We've been talking about it for a few years. Um, but I think it actually is going, to, is going to play out. So that's the first thing I think is going to happen at scale. Of course, we can all do, and we've all got great examples, I'm sure. We can all do great presentations on what brilliant jobs we're doing. And let me tell you, I could give you a fantastic presentation on what Unilever is doing in that area. But these are still, I think, pockets, and it's not broad enough. That's the first thing. I think voice um, will, will break through. Uh, I'm ex really excited about that. And um, if you think about it, you know, the way we interact right now with technologies, we, we get out this lump of steel and glass uh, called a phone, and we poke it with our finger. Um, and actually, the most human way of interacting is what we're doing right now is talking. And I think when we get to talking, 
uh, will, will, be, uh, will be good. Uh, so I'm excited about that. And the last thing I'm excited about is I'm going to drive uh, from Beijing to Paris in a 1940 Pontiac. It's going to take me six weeks, uh, starting at the beginning of June. It's a race called the Peking to Paris. It's got 120 cars, and that's going to be, that's going to be really fun. That's what I'm genuinely excited about. I've heard of it. We're going to establish a blockchain on that trip. Yeah. <laughs> and, and of course, people. blockchain. Whoops, I forgot blockchain. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think a lot of the emerging technologies, um, as Key said, will change all of us this year. And as marketers, we re this has to be a year of learning. I think more than anything else, our profession needs a really deep, concerted sort of uh, year of learning. Because um, I think there's so much that's changing so fast, and, uh, and that's incredibly exciting to me. I think it's a year where inclusion is more important than ever. Um, in how we train AI and how we portray people and how we bring uh, new people into the workforce to help shape the next generation of technology. So I, I think that's, I'm really excited about the work that we can do in that space. Um, and then I would just say, lastly, I think the model, the way we work is changing. I think for 30 years, you've seen companies build deep vertical silos and that has been in service of efficiency. Uh, you know, verticalization is a dramatic boost, generally speaking, to efficiency. But I think the pace and the rate and the expectations of consumers have changed so much that that model sacrifices too much in terms of effectiveness and agility. And so I see, I think you're seeing teams and from this, from CEOs down, think fundamentally differently about how to actually structure work, how to do work, um, shifts toward things like agile in really profound ways, breaking apart traditional vertical things. I think we have to do that in marketing. So I would say, you know, new technologies a culture of diversity and inclusion, and new ways of working are top of my list for this year. Thank you. So to kind of sum things up, because we're approaching the, we're actually past a little bit the end of our panel, uh, what I really liked about our discussion is that we talked a lot about the technology piece of it and how it can truly drive change. When we're talking about AI or blockchain, um, data-driven marketing in general, and maybe this being the year when it really kind of comes to fruition. But at the same time, we talked a lot about the human side of it. Um, for me, you know, this past year was an interesting one because I felt like, truly felt like consumers lost a lot of hope when it came to anything that was digital. And so to uh, actually use that moment of friction as a wake-up call to say, hey, we actually need to bring in the more human side of things into our advertising, into the technology, to train our algorithms, I think is a really important lesson. So hopefully this year we can truly combine the human and the technology like never before. Thank so you, thank Anda. you. Thank you both for the, an amazing thank conversation. You. And thank you to all of you.